So what I'd like to look at in this section is really at chapters 8 and 9 of the, of the life I'm just dipping into. One of the things that I haven't mentioned this yet, you'll notice in this book, indeed in all of Teresa's books, at the beginning of each chapter there's a little summary. And Teresa wrote those herself. And she wrote them after she had finished the book. In a sense, Teresa sort of wrote her own reading guide to her book. And it's worth paying attention to them. In fact, it's a good exercise to do is just to read those. And that most editions of the books in the table of contents, they give the headings to them this, and just to read down through the headings, one gets a sort of a quick reading guide to the book, and of course written by the author herself. So here in chapter eight, she has been telling us about her life up to, she's now 38, 39 years of age about, at the point she's now writing about here. She's was actually a 50 year old woman looking back on this, but, and she has come through this long stage of struggling with prayer. And here in chapter eight, in a sense she's, makes this very strong statement about prayer. And it's worth noting the heading that she gives to this chapter. It tells us, treats of the great, because she's writing a third person, her, of course, always herself, of course, but she's not saying that here, she's her. Treats of the great good it did her not to turn from prayer completely, and thereby lose her soul. And of what an excellent means prayer is for winning back what was lost, urges all to this practice, tells how it is so highly profitable, and that even though one may abandon it again, there's a great value in giving some time to so great a good. It's a very strong statement, this. And it has come out of, since the experience of many years of struggling with prayer. And here she is defending the fact that she persevered. It was worth persevering. Over and over again she tells us in her writings, that the worst thing that she, uh, uh, worst thing any person could ever do is to abandon prayer. That is the worst, for her, is the worst thing anybody could ever do, is to abandon prayer. And she, as we might say, has learned over these years prior to this just how tragic that is. Teresa, she'll tell us when she writes The Way of Perfection, which is the next book she will write after this, that she only writes from personal experience. And of course, everything she's writing here is from personal experience. She is not saying, oh, don't abandon prayer just as a sort of just a theory. She has lived through the pain and tragedy of abandoning prayer, drifting away from She has seen from experience the tragedy that this is. So this is a heartfelt plea here. 
She is where she is because she did not abandon prayer. And she uh, said, now turn away and thereby lose my soul. That's a, that's a, a strong statement. It's, it's losing who she is. Losing her deepest identity. She keeps repeating, and of the excellent means of prayer, so it's an excellent means, it's a great good. But it's not just about herself now. She's urging all to practice this prayer. She's teaching, urging everybody. Out of, from her experience. And I mentioned this morning just the, the radical or innovative nature of Teresa's writings. And this is another characteristic of her writings that was again new at the time. And that is writing from experience. This woman who writes from experience. People didn't do that. But it will become something very much after. Many others will follow Teresa in this. It's a woman writing from experience. And only writing what she has experienced. Or elsewhere she'll be more specific. What she has experienced herself. What she has seen others experience. What God has shown. What she, her experience of God has shown her. So it, she speaks from experience, and here she's speaking she's strongly, urging everyone to practice prayer. So how it is highly profitable. Etc. So, so this very and this chapter eight, which we haven't got the time to go into in detail, but it's a very strong statement about prayer. Prayer, of course, is the subject, in a sense, of the whole book, but here she's come to this point. I just want to draw it in. As I said, no, Teresa effortlessly shifts from addressing her readership, all of us, to God. And here in the middle of this chapter, she puts this lovely prayer in. I think I should just read it. Beginning of paragraph 6. O infinite goodness of my God, for it seems to me I see that such is the way you are and the way I am. O delight of angels, when I see this I desire to be completely consumed in loving you. How certainly you do suffer for one who suffers to be with you. Oh, what a good friend you make, my Lord. How you proceed by favouring and enduring. You wait for the others to adapt to your nature, and in the meantime, you put up with theirs. You take into account, my Lord, the times when they love you, and in one instant of repentance, you forget their offences. There, she's addressing the Lord, and she's putting into it, we say, what her understanding of prayer now is. Or the understanding of prayer that she has arrived at over these 38 years of life. And we can see the chief characteristics of it. You are a good friend, or what a good friend you make, my Lord. Teresa was a woman of friendship. And friendship was so important, so important. Her friends are so important to her. But the greatest of friends is Jesus. What a good friend you make. As the paragraph before this she tells us a prayer is nothing more than infant, in, intimate sharing between friends. Again, 
an often quoted remark of Teresa's. So friendship. This friendship. The other key characteristic of prayer it's friendship with one whom we know loves us. Whom we know loves us. That is very important for prayer. One has to know one is loved. We can only pray to one whom we know loves us. It's not prayer otherwise. And, again, this is not theory. This is something she has learned over these years of struggle. She's learned that he loves her. And she beautifully puts it here in this little prayer. You wait for others to adapt to your name. You waited. You wait for me. You you. You, Lord, have been patient with me. You've waited. And in the meantime, you put up with theirs, a tolerant God, a God who will wait. A God who waits. A God who is patient. And what she desires... And I desire to be completely consumed in loving you. The natural response when one knows one is loved is what to want to love. Desire to respond with love. That's what prayer is. It's not about following some method. It's not about ideas which she really struggled with. It's not about any kind of practices, rituals. It's about knowing that one is loved and responding with love. And she has arrived now at a sense at the real beginning. The beginning of life. The, la our, the last paragraph of this chapter, I think, is a very important one. I'll just read this line to you. I wanted to live, for I well understood that I was not living, but struggling with a shadow of death. And I had no one to give me life, and I was unable to catch hold of it. I wanted to live. That it sums up Teresa's desires. What she, uh, she is a woman who wants to live. And it is prayer, it is perseverance with prayer. It is an arrival as a right understanding of what prayer is. That's what she's got here. In this hour. She's come to this right understanding. Prayer is now fitting into the pieces of the jigsaw are fitting into place. They weren't up until now. It's love. It's friendship at one who will. Now she's ready to change. But she still isn't able to. I want to live. But... I look at my life and it's like a shadow of death. And she has quite literally struggled with that shadow in this earlier part of her. Even, even physically, to the point of almost dying physically. But much more what she's concerned with here is her spiritual dying. We can be physically alive, but be living a shadow of death. Not really be living. This woman wants to live. And live from the deepest place within her. And she has nobody, the way she puts it. No one to give me life. G 
Jesus, of course, becomes the one who will give her life. I was unable to catch hold. Now, she couldn't do it herself. Up until now, she's been trying to do it herself. She couldn't do it herself. Prayer has brought her to the realization, I cannot do it myself. So, we go on to the next chapter. If you're reading the chapter headings, you notice a shift in the chapter heading for chapter 9. The chapter heading for chapter 9 is this. Treats of the means by which the Lord began to awaken her soul and give it light amid such thick darknesses and strengthen her virtues that she might not offend him. Important thing here is treats of the, by which the Lord began to awake his God. The chapter headings up until now, the, em the focus was upon to read. Three, you know, in the previous one I just read, treats of the great good it did her not to turn away from prayer. Or back to any of the other ones. Treats of the way by which she lost the faith. Look, each of them, the focus is upon Teresa. Now, in number nine, the focus is upon the Lord. It's what he's doing. And from now on, it's what he's doing. There's the shift in focus takes place here. This chapter is often described as Teresa's conversion. This is one of them. There's other ones later on. But this here is an important shift. There's a shift here. Her prayer has brought her to the as far as she can come. Now it's God's intervention. It's his work from now on. And there are two things that bring about the change here in this chapter 9. One is an experience of a statue, before a prayer before a statue of Jesus, and her reading of St. Augustine's Confessions. The statue is one of the wounded Jesus. And both of these experiences, in a sense, set her free. I just spend a, a moment or two. One of the things we need to, if we're to read this book well, we need to understand how important images are for Greece. In Teresa's time, the catechism, the faith, was taught very much with images. The vast majority of people said, yes, they couldn't read or write. But they'd be taken into the churches, into the cathedrals, and they'd be shown, and they'd be taught. And that's how Teresa was taught her catechism. And images, statues, paintings, works of art, were very important to her right throughout her life. The nuns would complain the convent would be very short of money, but Teresa would spend all the money they have on some new statue that she liked. Mm -hmm. that artwork was very important. But it wasn't for the brilliance of the art, but for the prayer, the devotion that they brought about. And in this book, there, would be many, there are many stories of visions or experiences of Jesus, descriptions of these experiences. I remember some years ago, some of you probably were at it, the National Gallery in London did an exhibition of 16th century Spanish art. It was mostly sculptures. And I remember I was walking around looking at these, and I just said, hmm, these are Teresa's visions. These are her visions. 
she describes the Jesus that she saw. This is, the, it was the art, somehow, her visions. Because she's now at a time when most of the books that were of help to her were taken off of her. Images, statues became more and more important. And in her more profound experiences of God, of Jesus, these statues, these images become alive. Her images, her visions are somehow an entering very deeply into the reality that is depicted there in art for her. And here in this chapter 9, we find this statue of Jesus somehow helping her to enter very deeply into this relationship. But this is the Jesus who is going to change her. This is the Jesus who is going to change her life. There's a before and there's an after. And the other, here's the story of St. Augustine. Theresa tells us that she's particularly, felt particularly attracted to saints who converted, who conver who, for whom conversion experiences were important. Even though, as she's told us already in the prologue, and she'll tell us here again, she, of course, turned back many times. These didn't. At this reading of the Confessions of Augustine, a profound effect upon her. As I began to read the confessions, it seemed to me I saw myself in them. I began to commend myself very much to this glorious saint. When I came to the passage where he speaks about his conversion and read how he heard that voice in the garden, it only seemed to me, according to what I felt in my heart, that it was I the Lord was calling. I remained for a long time totally dissolved in tears and feeling within myself utter distress and weariness. Oh, how a soul suffers, God help me. I turn to God, and she just effortlessly turns to, Oh God, how a soul suffers, God help me, by losing the freedom it should have in being itself. Losing the freedom it should have in being itself. That's the there she is. That's the key. That's what she did not have up until now. The freedom to be herself. That's what she perceives that she had lost. Or hadn't yet arrived at. The freedom to be herself. That's what this encounter with Jesus was giving her. Only Jesus can give her this freedom. This inner freedom to be herself. As she's putting it there, where the weariness, the distress it causes by losing the freedom it should have in being itself. If a person really is oneself, living truth, with profound self-knowledge, relationship with truth itself, that person is the freedom. I marvel now at how I could have lived in so such great affliction. May God be praised who gave me the life to rise up from a death so deadly. As this is a dying and a rising. God who gave me the life to rise up from a death is a dying and a rising. A death to an old way of life, a rising to a new way of life. This woman who wants to live, now Jesus is bringing her to life. And it's a journey into a death and a rising. It's, yes, 
how St. Paul describes baptism a dying and a rising. So this woman who wants to live is coming to life, is being brought to life. And then she had finished the chapter by giving us some of the indications of this, the signs that she's now beginning to live. And she's told us in that little open little paragraph what they are. Her virtues, the virtues, the way she's living, the effects. And all the time, and she'll go into this much more detail later on in this book when she's describing any experiences of Jesus. It's the effects. That's how you know. If there's a real growth in charity, in justice, with any of the virtues, the good effects. An experience of God always leaves good effects. That's how we know she knows she's starting to live. So this experience that she's describing here is what that is going to profoundly affect her. This changes life and changes it forever. And, as, as we saw, she, she spent the chapter prior to telling us about, telling us about prayer, making a very strong statement about prayer. But then, she's going to go on, as you see in the outline that I gave you, and insert into her book a whole ten chapters on prayer. A whole treat. No, it was prayer that brought her, her, pers her own personal perseverance in prayer that has brought her, led her, disposed her, prepared her for what God does in her now. But she's saying to the reader, you readers, you've got to understand what prayer is if you're really going to understand what I'm speaking about. So she'll go out and she's now going to explain what prayer is. But it's all centered around this experience of conversion, of dying and rising, of coming to new life. Perseverance in prayer, what God does in prayer. It would not happen otherwise. For Teresa, prayer is the difference between life and death. Nothing less than that. It's only prayer that could bring her to the... And the point she had to be brought to was to knowing that she's loved. Knowing that Jesus is the friend who loves her. Then she can relate with him. She couldn't relate with him up until then. She tried to. And tried every possible means to, with varying degrees of success. But only the total acceptance that he loves her, that she can relate to him as a friend, a friend who is with her, wants to be with her, wants her to be with him, wants her to respond with love, Prayer brings her there. Then he brings about in her this awakening, this rising to new life. And this is the Teresa that is writing this book. This is the Teresa that the author herself wants us to know. The one that now has the freedom to be herself. She could not acquire this herself. Up until now, she said, I had nobody to bring me to life. And I couldn't grasp it myself. Now Jesus brings her to life. And this, more than anything else in this whole book, is what she wants the reader to understand. And she's going to 
take the reader now into this long treatise on prayer because the God, if you don't grasp this, you don't grasp the book. You don't grasp what the reason says. She's a woman who wants to live and is now living. She couldn't do that herself. Only Jesus. Only the love of Jesus could bring this about in her, and he does. Okay, wait. We'll leave it like that because we got.